Good morning. Welcome, everybody. We're going to give everyone a minute to join us here. We had over 140 people sign up this morning to join us. We're very excited. So I'm Lindsay Ganson. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Communications with Walk Bike Nashville. Thank you so much for being with us here this morning. Um, a big thank you to our event sponsors, Vanderbilt University, Bur Bird and Barge, Dines Barge Design Solutions. We'll have time for questions and answers at the end of the program. So please submit your questions for our panelists uh, via the Q&A box. And um, now I'm going to turn it over to Nora Kern, the Executive Director of Walk Bike Nashville, to tell you more about Vision Zero <laughs> and some of the work we've done to document Nashville's most dangerous intersections. Great. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, again, my name is Nora Kern. I'm the Executive Director of Walk Bike Nashville and really excited about the topic we have today and all of our speakers. Um, I did want to take a moment at the start before we get going to also talk about three people we lost in the last um, 10 days. Ronan Yao was killed. She was 31-year-old Vanderbilt graduate student trying to cross West End. Robert P Preston III, who was 41, died last weekend trying to cross Lafayette Avenue. And a person we don't know yet the name of, a 52-year-old man was killed trying to cross Buena Vista Pike. Um, also just a few days ago, all or five to seven lane roads um, with limited crossings or where there are crossings, clearly not sufficient enough. So we just wanted to start with just a quick moment of silence because that's hit a lot of us hard um, to see those losses so, so quickly before this presentation. So we'll just take 15 seconds to kind of to remember them. Great. Well, thank you all. Um, it's obviously a heavy way to start a webinar, but it's also why we're all here and why we know this, this topic is so important in Nashville and, and for cities across the whole country. Um, so, Lindsay, if you could go to my next slide. Um, we clearly have a problem in Nashville, not just because of these most recent crashes, but because of the trend over the last decade or more. Uh, 2019 was the most deadly year for pedestrians in the history of our city. And 2020 is actually already trending worse than 2019. We've had 15 people now killed walking, um, which puts us ahead of where we were at this time of year last year, um, which was 12. Um, and we also know that this problem isn't just, um, next slide, Lindsay, um, because our city is growing. Of course, our city is growing and we hear that a lot, but we know that this problem is something that um, is being born uh, more heavily by those people who are walking in our city. So we're approaching 30% of all fatalities on our roads um, are now pedestrians. And for those of us who know Nashville, certainly we don't have 30% of our traffic um, happening on foot and our people moving around. So some of our most vulnerable road users, those of us out walking, are bearing the brunt of the increase of fatalities here in Nashville. So um, we did want to open with just a little bit of history. So next slide. Uh, Walk Bike Nashville has been working on trying to figure out why this is happening and what we can do to, ch to change um, this situation and shift the trend for a number of years, as has the city. So in 2014, uh, Metro Public Works commissioned this um, pilot bicycle pedestrian safety project, which was really the first of its kind for the city. And you can see um, kind of briefly in that image there, it really looked at where there had been um, high concentrations of pedestrian crashes. And we started to see a pattern, which you can kind of see in that snapshot, of lots of crashes on a lot of the same streets. Um, our arterial streets, um, those streets we all know that are also known as pikes, the five lane, the seven lane sometimes, uh, 30, 40, 50 mile an hour streets that run through our city. Um, and unfortunately, we know that often these streets are the hardest to make improvements on. They were built for cars. 
um, and often either don't have sidewalks or didn't consider pedestrians at all um, when they were originally designed. So in 2018, Lindsay, next slide, um, we actually looked back at uh, what has happened since 2014 because we wanted to see what sort of progress was being made. Um, and unfortunately, but in the five or four and a half years uh, that we looked at in 2018, there had been 18 additional people killed at those locations originally identified, 257 people injured, um, and only four of those 50 original locations had seen any significant improvement in those five years. Um, and, you know, that also mirrored the trend citywide where we saw um, 78 people killed in that time period. And as we just saw, it's continued to get worse since 2018. So next slide, Lindsay. Um, so one of the things we also looked at in 2018 in our report, which we called Impossible Crossings, which is where we got the name for today's session, um, because often um, what we saw was these crashes were happening when people were trying to cross these major arterials. Um, so they were, they were attempting to cross the street, not able to do so safely. So we saw a couple trends. One big one is almost 50% of those top 50 locations identified in 2014 were at our 25 busiest bus stops, which makes sense. That's where a lot of people are needing to cross the street every day, multiple times a day to catch the bus. We also saw um, those bus stops and those crashes really happening again on those five lane, five, six, seven lane are state roads. So more than 80% of all of those crashes happened on roads that were controlled by TDOT um, and managed partially locally. Um, and uh, next slide, Lindsay. Um, just a quick snapshot of what these roads look like. And this, of course, for those of us who live here in Nashville, is nothing new. This is Murfreesboro Pike, um, but it could easily be Nolensville. It could be Old Hickory Boulevard. It could be Clarksville Pike. It could be Gallatin. Um, it could be Buena Vista Pike or West End. Um, and so too many of our streets look like this. And this was out on our policy walk. And we saw this mother and daughter trying to cross Murfreesboro and clearly not set up for success, um, not provided the basic infrastructure they would need to get across the street safely. Luckily, not all um, doom and gloom. We know that there are solutions for these types of um, intersections, these types of crossings. So in um, 2017, um, we had a campaign along with some other partners, Connection Americas, in the Saul Hadeen Center to look at the number one crossing identified in 2014, which was this one. Um, it's the Nolensville Welshwood intersection. When we did this campaign, seven people had been killed in seven years. It was the busiest bus stop in the city. Um, it had a Walmart, it had shopping on both sides, it had a considerable amount of housing on both sides. Um, and as you can see, there was no crosswalk um, in sight, basically. So people were crossing where they could. Um, but thanks to the great work of Public Works and TDOT, um, in a really rapid response, there was, um, next slide, you can see what was installed in kind of an in interim solution, um, which was kind of a pop-up solution. All of this was installed in just a matter of months. Um, and now today we actually have a permanent traffic light at this stop. And since then there have been no fatal crashes have happened at this location. Um, and, and we've heard from talking, being out there on the street and talking to people that it's made a lot of people's lives much better. So we're excited today to talk about um, some of the other solutions that are out there and really the best practices for what we've seen around the country um, and figuring out how we can make this not just a one-off. How do we get to addressing not just those crashes identified in 2014, but all of the new locations that we're hopefully going to prioritize and make an urgent kind of focus um, in this upcoming uh, Vision Zero Action Plan, which the city's in the, the beginning of working on. So. Um, I think I'll, I'll, with that, I'll turn it over to Lindsay and we can hear um, about from our panelists and hopefully and hear kind of how to turn it around. Thanks, Nora. Um, now we're going to hear from um, our panel from Tucson, Arizona. Um, we're going to hear from Dr. Richard Nossi and his colleagues, Ann Chineka and Gabe Thumb, uh, where in Tucson they improve pedestrian safety with what is known as a hawk signal. Um, Dr. Richard Nasti is the inventor of the Hawk signal and responsible for its adoption in Arizona and across the country. He's a retired transportation administ administrator for the city of Tucson after 30 <laughs> years and currently works as a consultant for the Pima Association of Governments, the Tucson Area Metropolitan Planning Organization. 
Uh, Gabe Thumb is the Transportation Safety Program Coordinator for the Pima Association of Governments. He has two decades of experience in transportation planning and traffic engineering in both the public and private sectors. And Ann Chineke is currently with the city of Tucson. She spent the past 13 years dedicated to improving accessibility and safety for people biking and walking in Tucson. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Nasi and a special <clears throat> thank you to our friends from Tucson for joining us early this morning. So thank you very much. Here we go. Dr. Nasi. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, basically, uh, Tucson was using the flashing yellow beacons for many, many, many years. And uh, basically, we found that about half to 60% of the drivers were stopped, and we, we decided there has to be a better way. We wanted to get our kids across the street, and we wanted to make sure the drivers stopped. We had to figure out some way to get red lights showing to the drivers. So the Hawk was developed back in 2000. Now, the, you, we had a picture there for a moment. There we are. The, uh, and if you want to know what I look like, that's me crossing the street after one of the first Hawks was turned on right there by the university. Six lane divided arterial, 35 miles per hour. And these are the streets that were giving us the most trouble and getting people across. So let's look at what a hawk looks like and how it operates. Next slide, please. Basically, the hawk is off in its first stages, so if there's nobody crossing, the lights are off, just like a railroad crossing. When a pedestrian comes up to the crosswalk at the intersection, pushes a button, and a warning light flashing yellow Phase two comes on, flashes the normal clearance to warn the driver that the light is being activated. Next, it goes to a solid yellow, which matches the state laws throughout this nation to warn drivers that they're going to be required to stop in between three and six seconds. Step four, double red lights. What was interesting about this is that uh, national studies showed that Stop signals, normal everyday stop and go lights, had about a 94% compliance rate. Drivers stopped at one signal red light. We're finding, and you'll see more about this in further studies, when we use the double red lights, we got an average of 97% stoppage on the red light. Then as the pedestrian moves through the crosswalk and the crosswalk is safe to pass through and is clearing, the signals go to an alternating red where the driver has to stop, wait, see if it's clear, but then may proceed and not wait. So there's not too much delay to the driver and there's not too much delay to the pedestrian. And once the pedestrian gets across the street, then it returns and rests as a dark signal, just like a normal beacon. Next slide, please. Let's see the results. Basically, this is from the Federal Highway Administration. They've done three major studies since 2000 on the Hawk operation. And Hawk is now in their spectacular seven for pedestrian uh, safety. It happens to provide the highest level of crash reduction of all the pedestrian devices. Basically, 97% crash reduction pedestrian crossings it's about a 29%, 30% reduction in rear-end collisions because most uh, traffic engineers worry about rear-end collisions increasing when you put in traffic signals. But at the Hawk, that's not the case. And it also is about a 15% reduction in all serious and fatal injuries. So it got the title Spectacular 7 from the Federal Highway Administration. Let's look at all the crossings. Next slide, please. As basically uh, you were talking about, how do you get across some of these more difficult crossings? That is something that has been of discussion in the area. This crossings, uh, this is a, uh, a study, a graph showing the speed of the crossings at the bottom 
starts on the left at 30 miles per hour and goes all the way up to 50 miles per hour. This study was basically completed in 2020. The sort of reddish ones are the lowish, lower speed units. And the higher ones are to the right on the higher speed streets. And those higher speed streets under the 50 are basically, uh, some of those are uh, five lane uh, roads and they're 50 miles an hour. And as everybody knows, you may post a street at 50 miles an hour, but drivers are doing a titch more, sometimes more than a titch more. The interesting to note is the driver yielding rate is consistently, no matter what the size of the street crossing, no matter what the speed, it always stays in the high 90s. It averages 90%, 97% driver yield rate at these particular crossings. And this is a January 2020 study by the Federal Highway Administration and the state of Arizona. Next slide, Lindsay. People are asking, well, are these really, really expensive? Well, there's a number of uh, basic elements to it. And if you go to the PedSafe site, um, written by Charles Zagier, basically a Hawk pedestrian crossing averages about $57,000, a little bit over that. And, but the flashing yellow beacons that you just saw at the uh, crossing uh, averages a little over $22,000. But now there's a new device. It's a solar hawk, and they average about $25,000, $30,000, and these run on solar power. So they are very applicable to the Tucson region, and you're using solar powered units in the um, Nashville currently, and they're applicable there also. So the price of the flashing yellow beacons and the price of the hawk beacons are basically the same. And as I mentioned before, as part of the Tucson study, because Tucson region has a lot of financial issues, recessions, conflicting demands for limited public money. So our mayor and council set it up that it would be a cost sharing between the school district or the commercial enterprises that one of these pedestrian crossings half paid by the city, half paid by another agency, and that helped get the crossings going. Once a bond program was passed specifically for pedestrian and bicycle safety, that changed and it was paid for by the bond program. But to get the program started, the community chipped in. Next slide, please. Implementation. This is Recently released by Federal Highway Administration, it's a safety guide of when you use a hawk and when you use a flashing yellow beacon. Take a look at the bottom. You'll see number seven, it's the flashing yellow beacon, rectangular rapid flash beacon, and number nine, pedestrian hybrid beacon, which is the other name. That's the formal technical name by Federal Highway Administration, but everybody here basically calls them hawk. If you look at your higher speed roads and you go off to the far right, you'll notice where the red arrow is, they are recommending against any flashing yellow lights at your wider, higher speed streets. You need to go to the red lights to get compliance. And the warrants for a hawk are about 20 pedestrians per hour and that could be relatively easily met compared to the 150 to 200 pedestrian per hour crossing for a normal traffic signal. You can find this in your Federal Highway Administration Guide for Safety Features, but the critical issue is to notice when you get your wider, higher speed streets, you need to use a device with a red light, and the Hawk is very applicable at those locations. Now let's look at the benefits. Next slide, please. In quick summary, no matter what the speed of the street, no matter what the width of the crossing, if it's five lanes or seven lanes, driver compliance stays at 
no matter what crossing it's at. Pedestrian compliance averages 91%, and we operate them with hot buttons, which means when the pedestrian pushes the button, the device starts to operate, and it has the lower MUTCD warrant level. And uh, basically, with posted speeds 45 or 50, they're finding there's high compliance by drivers and pedestrians. Of course, as we march with the Magnificent Seven, Hawks have a significant crash reduction of about 70% for either intersections or mid-blocks. And if these changes are being recognized in the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, this edition and the next edition, it can help support you folks today in Tennessee in getting pedestrians across the street Basically, as the next plan is showing, you want to get everybody across the street. Next slide, please. Well, your, your goal is just the same as our goal. Everybody gets home safe and sound every day. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Nasi. That was very informative and we're really excited about the potential of hawk signals here in nashville um, before i move on to our panel of uh, local experts to reflect on what they heard from your team in tucson um, i wonder if you could just answer um, what was the state of pedestrian safety in tucson at the time that led to the more widespread implementation of these hawk signals and how did they fit into a larger plan or goal to increase pedestrian safety? Um, and before you or Anne or Gabe jump in to answer that, I also just wanna remind everybody, we're gonna have a question and answer uh, section at the end. So please submit your questions um, in the Q&A box. So Anne or Gabe or Dr. Nasi, just to put this improvement in the context of the overall improvements in Tucson. I can start with the back in 2000 when the Hawk was first invented. Uh, basically, uh, just like uh, Jorge right now, I went to basically every pedestrian accident and we were having way too many. We had the flashing yellow beacons and yet the drivers didn't seem to catch on that yellow was considered only a suggestion. We knew that red means stop and yellow did not. So we had to find a way to start showing red lights and the warrants for a full traffic signal were impossible to meet in many of these locations. We needed something that would fit the crossing needs but didn't require a full traffic light because there are other problems when you put in a traffic light like the rear end collisions or the diversion of traffic through neighborhoods and, and neighborhood streets getting high speed traffic to uh, get onto the arterials, which are pretty busy. So we started looking for this device. This device is pretty similar to what is used in uh, basically Great Britain at some of their crossings. Um, we saw it there and uh, decided it was time to uh, try and bring it back, Americanize it and use it in uh, this country to get people back home safe and sound. Anne or Gabe, did you want to add anything to that? Well, um, go, go ahead, Anne. Well, one thing I'll say is um, I ran the city's bicycle and pedestrian program for many years, and I don't feel like we could have a program without the Hawk as a tool. So yeah. for people who rely on biking and walking for transportation, expecting them to cross six, eight lane roads where traffic's going 45 or 50 miles per hour, I felt like um, when you have a bus stop on one side and homes on the other, just having that tool is a way to make it so that people have an option to, to be safe um, walking and biking. So just want to re reiterate what Dr. Nassi is saying in terms of the importance. Um, and one other thing I'll say is uh, working on a lot of infrastructure, the Hawk is one of the least controversial in Tucson that we, we really don't face a whole lot of opposition at this point. And in fact, 
we have requests from people all the time to, to put these in. So we have a list of over a hundred requests. And one thing, that, so that led us to do a, prior, a ranking prioritization, looking at accessibility, equity, and safety, and trying to figure out what we didn't want to do is put in a hawk in a location that was politically charged, whereas another location that really needed it more uh, wouldn't get it. So we really wanted to develop a methodology to prioritize the locations that get the, the major investment. Yeah, and I'll just, uh, thanks, Ann. I'll, I'll just add on to that, um, by the way. Uh, this is a, um, yeah, the, as far as the prioritization process went, we, we went through quite a methodology to, to develop that, but I think the, the overall idea was to not, you know, typically um, in most engineering studies and, and, and engineering mindsets, um, it's all about, um, well, let's put, let's have a warrant here and like, you know, you must be this tall to get on this ride kind of mentality where it's like, well, we, we need you to, you know, go over this hurdle to be able to get this infrastructure improvement. We know the need is there. We don't, we don't need to get above that, that bar. We, we need to figure out where the need is greatest. And then, so that's why we, that's, we sort of developed that prioritization process with that in mind, where we know the need is there, where's the need greatest, let's figure out where those locations are and get this, this, uh, this infrastructure out there. Um, I would also add, um, Lindsay, can you go back to the slide that has the costs, the cost comparisons between the RRFB and the Hawk? I think it's back like three or four slides, maybe? There it is. Uh, there it is. Um, I just wanted to bring up and underscore the point that, you know, while, while there is a slight cost difference, even if you're not doing a solar hawk, even if you're doing the classic um, um, hawk compared to the RFB, the, the rapid flash beacon, the, the, the compliance with the hawk compared to an RFB is, is fairly huge. Um, so where you have consistency, as you saw on the other slide, about 97% average Com driver compliance with the Hawk, that means that they're, they're stopping almost every single time and they're, they're yielding to those pedestrians. Um, with the RFB, that can, that can go up to 90%, um, but it can also be down in the, in the teens. And so some of the studies that we've seen from Federal, Highway, Federal Highways is that it, it just depends on the road you're, you're on, it depends on the speed of the road, the width of the, the road, et cetera, your, your, um, your average daily traffic, et cetera. Um, so it's really, you have to be really careful, I think, when you're, you're looking at that and have some really context sensitive, um, have a context sensitive mentality when you're considering these improvements. I, for, for me, I would, I would like to throw up just, you know, if I need to throw a few more thousand dollars at it, I know budgets are tight. Ours are very, very tight here too. Um, but as far as getting people across the road safely, that's, that's really the way to go as opposed to the, to the flashing beacon. Thank you all. Um, we're going to move into our next panel um, of local experts. And again, um, if you have, have a follow-up question to that answer or um, something strikes you while you're listening to this panel, please put it in the Q&A box and we'll get to more questions at the end. Um, so thank you all, the team from Tucson. Uh, we really appreciate you being here and sharing um, this data and experience with us. Um, but now we're gonna bring it back to Nashville and hear from some local experts to reflect on what we've just heard. Uh, Peter Kaufman is a multimodal engineer and planner with Barge Design Solutions. He has 10 years of experience in planning analysis and design of multimodal transportation facilities. And uh, Peter is currently the lead engineer for Barge's traffic safety work. Uh, we have Jorge Riveros, who's the brand new, pretty brand new, Assistant Director, Chief Engineer at Metro Nashville Public Works. He comes to Nashville after time in Tucson, and we have him to thank for uh, bringing this great panel of experts to us this morning from Tucson and Austin. Um, he has over 20 years of diverse engineering and administrative experience, and uh, we're really, really excited to have him here in Nashville. And uh, finally is uh, Daniel McDonald, who's the multimodal planning manager for the Tennessee Department of Transportation. He previously worked with the Metro Nashville Planning Department and uh, with Walk Bike Nashville, full disclosure. So uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna ask the panelists a few questions and then uh, we'll open it up to the questions in the Q&A box. So first, I'm sure this is a question everyone is wondering, uh, does Nashville have any Hawk signals and uh, why or why not? Uh, 
Well, Daniel, I think you had the Tennessee data about the state roads and Jorge, kind of your baby there, I guess. Right, so I was gonna jump in. To, my understanding is that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Daniel, but I, I don't know that Nashville locally has any hawks, uh, maybe on a state route, there, there may be. Um, I know Dr. Nassi mentioned earlier that there was a, uh, a flashing yellow beacon on uh, Broadway um, but right now we don't have them, and 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 like and as Lindsay said, I, I was really excited to bring this panel on uh, to help bring them on from Tucson. Uh, as they stated, I, I started my career there. Um, I've worked with with some of these fine people that are that are on the panel, um, and and I was really excited to kind of bring that idea of bringing some other countermeasures to the area. You know, it's it's something that as I come and 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 uh, scan the landscape. And, and only having been here about five or six weeks, I'm trying to kind of wrap my mind around everything that's out there. And so it's exciting to kind of open that up and, and take a look at what other countermeasures are available to, to us uh, to help pedestrian and bicycle safety in our community. Um, as I said, I also was in Austin and Tucson and Austin have a, a lot of similarities as do Austin and Nashville. And I think one of the things that, that Austin's been doing is, is really kind of funding a lot of these uh, pedestrian hybrid beacons or hawks as we call them in Tucson. Um, and, and I think they've been well on the heels of Tucson, if not very close, maybe even surpassing the, the, uh, the amount of hawks that are, are currently in Tucson. But it, it was really great to see that both communities have taken that, you know, this, this type of safety very seriously. And I think it's time to start looking at that here as well, looking at the type of pikes that uh, Nora described earlier. We have a, a really good um, opportunity here to start looking at what other um, countermeasures we can use in order to, to help uh, our most vulnerable users out on the roadway. Yeah, I'll, I'll put my, my foot in my mouth a little bit here and say, I, I don't think uh, we have any, I couldn't, uh, find any on our state roads. And I, th I think we haven't done it before because we haven't done it before. Um, that's, we've, we've, uh, we've put, put some hawks in, uh, or sorry, the, uh, the rapid flashing beacons. Um, but the, the data is there. Uh, we, we know we have unsafe areas. Um, and like Richard was saying, we just want people to get across the street uh, and get home safely. Um, so at TDOT, we have a new pedestrian road safety initiative that uh, is looking at uh, these these high crash locations all across the state. Um, and uh, the Hawk is um, is uh, supported, uh, as I said, by the data, um, also by FHWA's countermeasure list. Um, so I, I think this is a tool that that we will be looking very, very closely at um, in some of these areas. And we're seeing in the chat box that there's uh, installations in other areas of the state. Apparently Knoxville is going to get one soon. I know there are a few in West Tennessee. So there's definitely getting to be broader experience with these solutions and hopefully mm -hmm. people going on trips and seeing them in Tucson and other places will help bring them back to Tennessee. Um, so I also wanted you all to reflect on what are some of the other best practices from around the country for fixing the kind of impossible crossings that, that Nora told us about. These crossings on arterial streets with more than four lanes with speed limits above 35 miles an hour on busy transit and commercial corridors where we continue to see year after year the most pedestrian uh, deaths and injuries. What, what, what else can be done and how, how can that fit into a larger program of improvements? Peter, do you want to take that as a designer or, I mean, I can jump in, but. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, and we've seen some of that in the earlier slides of the presentation. I think one of the easiest ways to reduce conflict is by looking at conflict points, reducing the number of conflict points that someone crossing the street has to encounter at uh, one step of the process. So uh, adding in refuges is a huge thing, especially on these wider roads. Uh, gives you a chance to have a much more acceptable gap. It's easier to find a gap that's large enough for you to make that crossing. You're not hanging out in the middle of the street on a double yellow or in a two-way left turn lane waiting for that second stage of the crossing. Uh, so adding in those refuges is a very big one. And that actually ties into uh, 
a bigger element that we can do more systemically for our roadways and that's implementing more access management strategies. One of the easiest ways to get, I will say one of the most effective ways to get a median, it's not easy at all politically, is adding in more medians. We've got these wide roads with two way left turn lanes. And if we're able to start looking at managing the level of access on some of these commercial corridors, uh, putting in medians is a good way to prohibit dangerous left turn maneuvers by vehicles and it also has the side benefit of creating refuges. Uh, so I think access management and looking at some of these commercial corridors, what do they look like longer term and how do we make them more livable, more walkable streets at the same time uh, gives benefits for all road users, not just pedestrians trying to cross the street, but also limiting some of the more dangerous maneuvers that drivers have to encounter to get in and out of some of these small scale commercial retail establishments with a hundred driveways in a given block. Yeah, I would, I would, I, sorry, please. I was, was going to say, I was going to second what Peter said. I think one of the things I've noticed on a few uh, field site visits I've made in, in this age of COVID-19, I know we're not going out a lot, but uh, taking a look at, at our access management practices, I think that's always a, one of those things to take a look at and, and see what you can do better in terms of, of um, bringing some of those conflict points down. So I've noticed some, some particular areas that, that just seem to have uh, issues with access management. I think there's opportunities again, to look at ways that we uh, do some of the directional tra traffic and, and how we move it, how we move it in and out of sites, you know, if that might be a right turn, right, you know, right in, right out only with a little pork chop island Kind of slow traffic down on some of these access points uh, as, as well as looking at medians and, and where they might work best. I think one of the things that we're trying to get to here in Nashville is, is better a data collection and I think that's going to drive a lot of our decision making. You know when we can start to identify high, the high injury networks with real um, uh, real-time data and really start to put dashboards together that, that show uh, where our high injury networks are, and we can make some of those data de uh, driven decisions as, as the Tucson folks talked about a little bit. You know, there's there's obviously the political side, but there's also um, just from a prioritization uh, matrix that they put together and looking at issues of equity and safety and accessibility. You know, we have opportunities there as well. Um, as Dr. Nassi said, you know, when when you present this from from the point of view of uh, in particular, if you're looking at schools and, and areas around schools that there might be, um, you know, uh, issues of safety, you know, nobody is ever going to say, you know, we don't want the kids to get home safely. So it could be the way to, to really get the, the ball rolling here is to look at those opportunities where we have uh, very vulnerable users and, and really put it to the community as, as to what they want to see in the long run. And, and again, access management is one of those things as well. Um, Again, I'm not totally familiar yet with the Nashville uh, area, but you know that's that's part of uh, some of my charge is to start to look look at what it looks like and, and get a get a feel for everything, so that we can start to bring some of these uh, countermeasures to the area. And, um, piggybacking on on um, what uh, what you both were saying about the uh, the refuge islands, that's that's mid block crossings and refuge islands are absolutely. One of the things we're focusing on with the pedestrian road safety initiative, um, taking that one step back to get to a point where you can do that, you have to have a center turn lane. Um, so looking at some of these roads that we have that are four lanes or six lane roads with no center turn lane, uh, absolutely essential to get a reconfiguration in there, a road diet um, to put that center turn lane in. Um, and <clears throat> TDOT has recently started um, trying to um, push out their um, resurfacing lists, uh, four state roads, um, one year up to three years. Um, and that's, uh, that's a really good thing because it gives uh, local governments like Nashville the opportunity to come talk to us and say, hey, we've identified this road as a place uh, where we could do a reconfiguration a road diet, get that center turn lane in, and then we can get the ball rolling uh, on some of these refuge islands, mid block crossings. Great, just feels like uh, the, there is, there are so many solutions and um, so many potential improvements that, that could improve 
our safety. Um, but as we've alluded to a number of times already um, in this session, we're in difficult financial times for the city and state. So, um, and really the whole country. And uh, we're, we're expecting likely worse times to come. So um, we just passed really a, a crisis budget here in Nashville. So taking that into consideration, um, how can we continue to make progress and improvements even in these difficult times financially for the city and state? Well, I, I can start. I mean, development is one way to look at it, right? There's, there's opportunities. You know, Nashville isn't saying slow down. That's really development. Um, like other cities across the nation, yes, we've all been hit by COVID. But one of, the, one of the industries that really hasn't been necessarily slowed down too much is the construction industry. And so there's opportunities with, with working with our development uh, side of the house and seeing what other, um, again, countermeasures we can bring. You know, if we can identify some other things, you know, we're, we're always looking at context sensitive. We're looking at now a lot of transit oriented development. Um, you know, one of the things that I've been talking to, um, you know, my, my staff about is, is looking at uh, different opportunities. And, and that might include some of the, um, you know, looking at, at curb electrification or curb space management or bike corralling or scooter corralling. And so it brings those multimodal improvements. But if there's areas that we identify that maybe we would have put a signal because it's warranted, but maybe it's not. And, and maybe that's an opportunity to put a, put a hawk in um, and try something new. I saw a question earlier, and I think Ann kind of answered it a little bit. Um, you know, we always talk about four E's and we talk about enforcement and education and evaluation and engineering. And um, that's the thing we have to do is we have to have a good way of educating the public on how to use these, these devices. Uh, there's a lot of information out there already. Uh, you know, really it's, it's getting the word out. It's getting, um, you know, information out to the media outlets, out to social media, uh, talking to people, you know, the council members and everybody around the city about what we're trying to do. And I think that education will help spark a lot of interest in, in trying to bring some of these things like the, like the hawk. And then again, if we have a very concentrated public service announcement and those kind of things, um, you know, that can really help bring these devices into town. Like, like I said, Anne, I think answered a question earlier um, about, about some of that stuff. And, and, and I'm sure that City of Tucson and others are willing to share that information so that we can create a program around that, make it a little bit more successful here. But I think, again, going back, it's, it's working with development communities too, you know, it, it's, they, they, Right now, they have the money to do this, um, and if we have ways in, in, uh, to get them to help us out, you know that may be one of the ways we do it without without the uh, uh, benefit of having a good funding mechanism right now. Um, <clears throat> so, in addition to the uh, to the reconfiguration um, possibilities that we have through restriping, which is pretty pretty cost effective uh, way to at least get. Uh, get some different paint down on the road. I'll go ahead and plug uh, our multimodal access grant, which uh, is a, mil a million dollars total project. We do this every year. Um, we, we're in the notice of intent phase right now to apply. Um, it's a 5% local match, which is very low um, comparatively. Um, that would be $50,000 out of a million dollars. Um, and that's, that's a really cost effective way. I mean, you could get you could get a dozen hawk signals in for that, you know. Um, so um, I'm encouraging municipalities all over the state to apply for that. Um, and that happens every year. And I would say that, you know, even though sales tax revenue and other municipal sources of income are going down, there's an opportunity going forward. You know, every major recession over the last 90 years has included some kind of stimulus package, some kind of investment component. And we really need to make sure that we're leaning on our legislators, especially, especially at the federal level, to make sure that it's not just focused on freight and rural access. You know, these things are important, but that we also have a major safety component in whatever kind of funding comes down from the federal government after, after all this is over. That's a great point, Peter. And that's definitely something we've been um, keeping our eye on at, at Walk Bike Nashville um, and also through a, a coalition we're a part of called Connect Mid TN that's focused on transit. Uh, we definitely want to make sure money coming from the federal government 
is uh, funding multimodal projects. Um, so with that, I'm going to, I'm taking a look at uh, some questions in the, the question and answer box. And we had a few people ask a few different ways um, how the prioritization worked in Tucson. Folks want to know more about um, were transit stops included, accessibility, equity, safety, um, how, how did that ranking system work? And there was also a question, if you, you'd be willing to share um, a, a document or resources that, that break this down with folks in Nashville. Um, I'll we'll jump in and, and Gabe and Dr. Nassi, please, please jump in as well. But I will absolutely share any materials ever. I feel like as the public sector, it's great that we can borrow and, and steal from each other. Um, so in terms of, and I don't have it all off the top of my head, but yes to accessibility, we really looked at where are people trying to get to. So schools and parks and libraries and grocery stores. Um, distance within those those types of locations score higher. We looked at equity and, and used proxies for folks that rely on biking and walking as transportation. Um, so things like um, uh, we looked at uh, incomes, we looked at um, vulnerable users overall, and then um, the third component is safety and really looking at where are high crash locations. Um, and, and yet the one thing that that one challenge we had is trying to use count information because we know that, well, people might not be crossing in a location today. If we put a hawk, it's going to make it much easier and there's that latent demand and there's going to be a lot more people. But um, Gabe or Dr. Nassi, did you want to jump in too? I, I would jump into and just add it just to dovetail with what you're saying. And uh, we also took a look at like um, a lot of infrastructure um, um, present. So what, was there a, a median a refuge island? Was there lighting present? Was there how many lanes were there? What was the ADTs? What was the speed, posted speed, um, et cetera, et cetera. We built a lot of that into it too. Um, in addition to looking at the equity issues and looking at the safety um, crash history experience. Regarding the, the count issue, that's a huge I mean, that's a challenge, I think, across, you know, everywhere, people trying to look at uh, uh, what, the, what the, the exposure levels are, basically, what are the count levels. Um, and we've got a really great count program. We've done a bike bed count program since 2008 here, where we collect over 100 locations every year, a volunteer count. We look at peak hour counts. Um, and even with all that data and a data-rich environment, it's hard to extrapolate from a point level to a network level. That's too geeky of a topic probably, but um, it's definitely a, a, a challenge for us. But yeah, we, we, it's a pretty, pretty um, uh, data rich um, um, prioritization process. And yeah, we'd be happy to, to share that with you. We can, we can list all those things and kind of what, what went into that. It was a multi-year process. It took a while. Great. Um, yeah, I think we, if, uh, Ann, you wouldn't mind sharing some documentation on that, we can share it out in our follow-up blog post uh, that we'll send to everybody who registered via email. Um, so uh, we had a question from uh, Councilwoman Angie Henderson here, who wants to know more about the new pedestrian safety initiative uh, from TDOT. Um, we know that 80% of our pedestrian fatalities are happening on the state route. So um, she's very intrigued to know about this program and then also just wants to know a little bit more about the multimodal access grant. Um, where have those dollars been used in Nashville in the past? Um, so the, for the pedestrian road safety initiative, this is funding that comes um, from the, the federal government um, through a program called the Highway Safety Improvement Program. Um, we get a certain percentage of that, just like uh, you were pointing out um, as a possibility, Angie, and it's actually based on the percentage of pedestrian road fatalities. So we're at something like 13% uh, of that money, which don't quote me on this, I think it's gonna fall somewhere in the four to $5 million a year. Um, that'll change yearly. Um, the, and, and we've talked about this program for some time, but uh, haven't, uh, initiated any projects yet um, so we're we're revamping it um, and and you get to a point that one of our challenges really is the speed 
and the urgency um, at getting these projects in. Um, so the, uh, there, there are a couple of, of things that we need to do. Um, one is getting a pipeline of projects going um, because even if we have the funding today um, and we have the idea today to design, engineer, uh, plan, contract, get that project in the ground, we're gonna take two years to do that. Um, and we need, we need to do that faster. Um, so getting a pipeline of projects going will, will help with that. We've got uh, seven locations and corridors under contract um, for design in Nashville now. Um, but we also need to work on uh, our temporary applications. Uh, we had what Nora um, showed uh, at the, the intro um, was uh, what from all sides I think would say was a very successful intervention in, on Nolansville Pike. Um, creating a process to do that and do that quickly at locations that um, that uh, we see a real need um, until we can get the permanent infrastructure in um, is 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 something that we're working on and we we really would like to get that going um, as far as the uh, multimodal access grant um, there actually was a uh, a grant in 2019 that Nashville got uh, from that, which was the McNally intersection improvement on uh, on Nolansville. I think it did a lot of uh, big crosswalk improvements. Um, so uh, that you can find all the information on that if you search for our um, multimodal uh, office planning office online or multimodal access grant TDOT. Um, and I can I can share the link in a second here as well hopefully that, uh... thank you thank you daniel um mm -hmm. so we had another question back to specifically about the hawk um that i feel like it's it's important um to discuss as uh there's a national conversation happening about um the standard ease of traffic safety and the e of enforcement um so some of those compliance rates that we saw in your presentation, Dr. Nasi, did that include uh, enforcement efforts? Um, and does enforcement need to happen along with the HOP to see those kind of uh, compliance rates? Or is that purely the infrastructure itself? Basically, that was a, just a natural um, activity in the beginning, there was uh, significant enforcement because we worked hand-in-hand uh, -in -hand with the Tucson Traffic Enforcement Group so that they knew what the hawk uh, was coming. They knew what the signal indications were met. We got the ordinances in place that were necessary. But after that, it pretty much settled down. In fact, one of the uh, beginning things was uh, once the red lights came on, the drivers wouldn't move when they could move, and it was flashing. But I think just like every other place, it's not tough to get a driver to get going again. And that, that's people waiting at the crossing when they could go, and the, and the pedestrian was gone. That settled down in approximately the first few months. And so all those uh, facts and figures are from nationwide activity at the 97 percent be it tucson or austin or wherever the hawk was in operation that was under normal uh, traffic enforcement levels which uh, may be very heavy or may be very limited yeah i i want to jump in uh, with dr nasty said in austin we we work pretty hand in hand with our uh, traffic enforcement group we met with them weekly uh, they were part of a Vision Zero action plan that we had in place, but we had the opportunity to work with them. And then when we would do um, new installations of Hawks, we'd make sure that there was at least, you know, uh, some of that traffic enforcement uh, in the area so that they could see what the compliance was. Typically, we would start with, with the educational portion, right? We didn't want to be heavy handed and say, you know, here, you're going to get a ticket, but we wanted people to be educated about how to use it. So um, like, like Tucson, Austin had a good compliance rate. People were used to seeing them. There, there's quite a few out there. But for those people that maybe didn't understand the, how to use it too well, uh, we wanted to make sure that there was that, that an education uh, campaign behind it as well 
so that people could start to learn how to use it and be more compliant with the device. Um, I think that's that definitely goes hand in hand. Like like Dr. Nassie said, you have to work with your traffic enforcement group um, in order to to really make the best use of, of putting one of these devices out. Um, that's just my my two cents there. One one thing I'll say that sense was golden. Um, one thing I'll say in terms of thinking about compliance and enforcement, um, since I came to the city, I came during the recession and there were not, um, our police department was very clear they didn't have the resources to enforce and we're still getting those high compliance rates. But on the um, pedestrian side, the one thing, Dr. Nassi touched on it, one thing that's really important to have pedestrians comply is having that hot button so that it's so that when you press the button, it, it goes off quickly and you're not waiting 30 seconds or a minute for it to go off. And I think that's huge in terms of compliance on the part of the people biking and walking and using them. Great. Well, we're running short of time already, but we did have a, a, a few different people ask a few different ways. Um, what is the opposition to installing more of these in Nashville? Um, what obstacles specifically um, Council uh, Member Benedict is asking uh, you, Jorge, to outline the obstacles we may face in building Hawks? Uh, yeah, a few different folks ask this different ways. Like why this seems like such a great solution, the, the cost seems very cost effective. Why, why can't we do more of these? faster what is this opposition we what opposition might we expect what obstacles would we hey, need to you, you don't have opposition for me i i mean i i've seen the hawk and i and i love it um maybe again I'm, I'm just going back to being a tucson guy but you know i've seen them i've seen how they work they're, they're a great uh, device to put in place um you're not going to see opposition from me uh i think again there's great opportunity i think what daniel said earlier about you know we haven't we haven't done it because we haven't done it. Uh, and, and there may be a couple again in the state of Tennessee, but there, there's certainly, you know, a new way of thinking here. And, and I said, my staff has been very open and very receptive. Again, I think it, it's just one of those things. Yeah. If you don't see it, you don't know what's out there. Um, you know, with my experience, having seen it in Tucson and Austin and, and deployed at, at wide scales, you know, I, I think, you know, I'm saying to, to the staff here, I'm challenging them to look at these different devices and say, why don't we just go ahead and do something like that? Um, the biggest thing that I ran into as far as, and maybe it's the same here at TDOT and Daniel could answer a little better, uh, but it, in Texas, uh, Texas DOT controlled some, you know, had state roads that went through some of the local cities, um, particularly in Austin, we had several uh, state routes that went through and, and TxDOT was a little bit more, uh, risk averse to putting hawks uh, on any of their state facilities. Now, it just took a little bit of discussion with them and, and you know, we were able to kind of, um, in Austin at least, bring them our way, thinking about how we could do some of these treatments a little bit better. Um, they had certain warrants that needed to be met, like for example, or, or that wouldn't uh, necess necessitate the use of a hawk for them is, you know, if it was a certain number of lanes, it was a certain speed, uh, but that's what we were trying to let them understand is that, you know, we recognize these are the streets that are most vulnerable. We need to do something about that. And, and after some discussions with our district uh, engineers at TxDOT, we were able to kind of uh, bring them around to our way of thinking. So I think it's just educating people, really. And I, I don't think that it's going to be a tough sell, especially if, if, you know, we realize that we don't want to use these or lose these people. You know, we're, we're looking for vision zero. And we really want to, you know, uh, not just talk the talk, but walk the walk. If we're going to do that, we have to have devices and countermeasures in place that really help us solve this, this issue uh, and these tragedies. Thank you. Um, we're pretty much out of time. We did have a couple more questions um, that we will try to answer in our uh, follow-up blog and materials. Um, thank you all for being here today. Um, we had, I think we had over 110 people on at one point. Um, so um, we really appreciate um, our panelists being here, our panelists from Tucson um, and our local panelists. Um, 
A very special thank you to our sponsors, in particular Civic Engineering, Bird, uh, Core Development, Alliance, Bernstein's, Hastings, and Gresham Smith. Our work would not be possible without our sponsors, especially this year. Um, we are going to be continuing this speaker series. Um, our next one is going to be on Tuesday, July 28th. Save the date. We'll be sending out more about it soon. And it's going to be focused on data-driven Vision Zero programs. Um, Jorge and a couple of the other panelists mentioned the importance of data. Um, so we're going to dig into some uh, best practices from around the country about how they've used data to shape their Vision Zero programs. Um, we will make a recording of today's event available um, to everyone who registered and anyone who might be interested. Um, it will be on our YouTube channel later today. Um, again, thank you all for being here. Um, more to come. And uh, thanks for your support of Walk Bike Nashville. Bye, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for your attention. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Lindsay, thanks for organizing everything. It's been great. A lot of fun. Great. Thank you so much. We appreciate yeah, your you. support. Thank you very much. Have a good morning. <laughs>